Hello and welcome to the Business Standard Morning Show. I'm Ishan Gera and here are the stories for the day. Its meeting on Saturday, the GST Council approved the decriminalization of certain offenses and clarified the tax provisions on a number of items, including sports utility vehicles. However, the Council ran out of the time and about half its agenda, including setting up a GST appellate tribunal, was left undiscussed. So what were the key decisions taken at the meeting and what's going to be their impact? Bhaswar Kumar brings you the answers. The 48th GST Council meeting has recommended that certain offences under Section 132 of the Central Goods and Services Tax Act 2017 will be decriminalised. Under the present GST law, there are two types of penalties. Monetary fines can be imposed and goods seized for violating statutory provisions. Tax authorities can impose these penalties. The GST law also provides for criminal penalties, including imprisonment. But that can be only awarded by a criminal court. So what are the steps recommended at the latest meeting? The first one is decriminalizing offenses such as obstructing or preventing officers from doing their duties, deliberately tempering with material evidence and failure to supply information. Uh, there's a provision in the Act that provides that there are certain scenarios that you're deemed to be liable to prosecution. And the scenarios include where you raise a fake invoice or you're, you're actually not made a supply but raise an invoice to trade credits or where you have actually evaded tax in some sense and uh, collected tax and not paid to the government. So those uh, particular scenarios anywhere in the world would trigger uh, penalties and prosecution as well. In this prosecution provision, we had three entries, one that talked about tampering of evidence, obstructing the duty of an officer, and not providing information that was also in the category of prosecution. So what this did was that it made a situation where a company, if it fell under this category, it triggered the prosecution provision where a commissioner approval was required, and then you would have a, a potential arrest. And depending on the category, for these three categories, it was bailable. But needless to say, when it's so subjective, it was a not necessarily a welcome provision. So with these three entries out of the way from the prosecution provision, I do think there are a lot of other provisions that will take care of penalties. So it's not that this will let companies do whatever they wish, but I do think it will at least remove that fear and ambiguity around when a prosecution will be invoked. For these three scenarios, you would have to follow the Code of Criminal Procedure and the IPC, but the good news is the three scenarios are now done away with. The second recommendation is doubling the minimum threshold of tax amount for launching prosecution from 1 crore rupees to 2 crore rupees, except for the offence of issuing invoices without supplying goods, services or both. The third one is reducing the compounding amount from the present range of 50 to 150 percent of the tax amount to a range of 25 to 100 percent. According to online tax filing website ClearTax, compounding of offences is a method used to avoid litigation. When a case is being tried in a criminal court, the accused has to appear before it at every hearing represented by an advocate. With compounding, the accused is no longer required to appear personally and can be discharged on the payment of a compounded fee. Till now, the amount payable for compounding was 50% of the tax involved, subject to a minimum of 10,000 rupees. The maximum amount for compounding was 150% of the tax or 30,000 rupees, whichever was higher. I think they are reducing the seriousness of the offence uh, in the sense that uh, for no, so no compromise on the basic amount, no compromise on the, any interest or penalties, but uh, whatever is uh, due payable in lieu of prosecution, that will get uh, reduced. So that's how the compounding works. There was news for automakers and car buyers too. 
Saturday's GST Council meeting also came out with a clear definition of SUVs that would attract the highest cess of 22% over and above the GST rates applicable on motor vehicles. The higher rate of compensation cess of 22% will apply to any motor vehicle that fulfills four conditions. The vehicle is popularly known as an SUV. It has an engine capacity exceeding 1500 cc, it has a length exceeding 4000 mm and it has a ground clearance of 170 mm or above. The clarification could result in changes in the prices of certain SUV models. However, automakers are still looking into the details of the clarification. The Society of Indian Automobile Manufacturers has welcomed the clarification on the definition of SUVs, saying that it was on the lines of its discussion with the Finance Ministry. In India, SUVs have seen a big jump in their demand in recent years and are slated to drive automakers to record sales this year. What could be the reason why CM has welcomed it is because a lot of sedans uh, fulfill some of the uh, uh, some of the conditions. So there are four conditions which have been laid down in the definition of an SUV, uh, which was uh, uh, which have now been reiterated. Whether these were all or and conditions was something which was a subject of dispute. And there is a uh, there is an including definition. So uh, this is an including definition, and whether this was creating a restrictive effect or whether it was expanding the uh, the definition that was also being uh, talked about. So litigation or disputes were being created where even those uh, vehicles, which we do not normally understand as SUVs, were being asked to pay duty uh, uh, compensation says at a higher rate. This would take away that ambiguity and only SUVs will, which fulfill all the four conditions simultaneously and uh, uh, fall in that category would accordingly be liable to pay a higher uh, compensation says. So it's a very welcome move and I, I think uh, the higher rate would only apply to genuine SUVs. So I do not see any cost uh, factor coming in or any of the SUVs getting any cost here. The FM also very categorically reiterated that there is no new levy or this will, should not create any a new levy. It's only a clarification. The meeting on Saturday was held after a gap of six months, but the GST Council could not address some of the important agendas like establishing a GST appellate tribunal and the tax treatment for online gaming, tobacco and good car. All of this indicates that the government may have taken its foot off the pedal as far as making the indirect tax regime more effective. No tax increase on any item was announced at GST Council meeting last week. That's welcome news for the masses. But the men at the hem of affairs in government are apparently unhappy with the long vacations of Indian courts. The Justice and Law Minister of India, Kiran Rajiju, recently said that the vacation period of Indian courts is an inconvenience to the people. The Law Minister's remark on the functioning of the judiciary has opened up a debate if Indians, in general, take plenty of leaves. Tushar Varma spoke to legal and HR experts to find out. The Supreme Court of India today sits on 69,598 pending cases, 488 of which are constitution bench cases. Those are big numbers. It's not surprising that the Law Minister of India, Kiran Rijiju, questioned the relevance of long vacations of Indian courts during a recent discussion at the Rajya Sabha. The Law Minister's remark has opened the debate on the workings of the judiciary, but legal experts say the vacation period is usually spent writing judgments. They also emphasize that since law is an intellectual exercise, some days of rejuvenation are necessary. As far as the High Court and the Supreme Court are concerned, it's not that the judges are not working when they are not sitting in court. 
you have a continual process of uh, yeah, both uh, preparing judgments as well as a continuing legal education there are they go they go in for uh, refresher courses and so and they go in for legal seminars and so many other things a judge's job is intellectually very strenuous that in the supreme court you uh, the uh, the judges are likely to be people who are above the age of 60 but there is more to the debate on vacations of indian courts that the law minister pointed at what's the vacation trend among employees in the organized sector in a year all indian employees are entitled to 17 gazetted holidays mandated by the government of india it includes major religious festivals and days of national importance such as independence day republic day and gandhi jayanti these are guaranteed holidays the government of india also lists restricted holidays There are 36 such listed holidays which include days of religious importance but unlike gazetted holidays these are optional many indian organizations have a 5 day work week policy while some follow 6 day work week some on the other hand have alternate saturdays off a 2017 survey conducted by expedia an online travel platform ranked india as the fifth most vacation deprived country in the world it was preceded by south korea france malaysia and hong kong The survey suggested that Indians utilize fewer entitled vacation days. In fact, it also said that 28% of Indians do not go on vacations at all. So, uh, I think rightly said, now India is one of the most vacation deprived countries in the world. Uh, not just on uh, annual leaves, the Indian score low even on short vacations. Uh, Indians they have the tendency to save for the future and and, and that's how every Indian household Uh, follows and that they do with their leaves also so the number of people who are actually not taking a uh, the entire list of vacation which they are eligible for is quite high from an indian point of view it is presumed that more leaves mean better work life balance but when an hr platform called namely analyzed data of over 125000 employees it studied in the us it found that leaves are often underutilized even by employees who enjoy unlimited leave policy the study found that most employees felt guilty and shy in taking leaves for too long uh, in india productivity is is kind of linked to availability on on site availability a lot of times so it's like if you are present if you are available i mean you're productive and you're useful the moment you are you're not uh i mean there's going to be a uh, some kind of a suspicion about your uh, capability of delivering that's a, that's a myth that probably needs to get bust it's all about visibility so in indian context a lot is about visibility because the sme is a small medium organizations are still working on manual you know uh, processes in 2019 global employment website monster.com surveyed 2000 working professionals to analyze the work life balance of indian employees Around 60% of the respondents rated their work-life balance terrible. The study reveals lack of sleep, depression, anxiety, and hypertension were the top work-related illnesses Indians deal with. So, what should Indian organizations do to improve work-life balance? One is succession planning. I mean, need to have enough successors who would take up their responsibility in their app. And second is automation. A lot about automation needs to happen. You know, I mean, uh, there are tools that are there. so while people are away they need to they can always use a task management collaboration tool where they can delegate their roles or responsibilities within the team in an organized way so that uh, even if they are not there and they can conveniently be unavailable and the work still still doesn't get hampered of course a good work life balance promotes productivity a study by the organization for economic cooperation and development attests to that as well The study argued the amount and quality of leisure time of employees are crucial for their overall well-being. India still ranks poorly in work-life balance, and this is applicable across all sectors from the judiciary to corporates. While the debate on long vacations in Indian courts continues to rage on social platforms, it's time India in recognizes the disappointing work-life balance of its workforce. A few policy tweaks can go a long way to boost and sustain the efficiency of its men and women at work.
Moving on to the markets, despite firm revenue growth in quarter one, Dublin-based Accenture left analysts unimpressed as it pegged the next quarter's revenue growth below projections. The company also sounded cautious about client spending. So does this signal more trouble for Indian IT companies ahead? Harshita Singh has the details. IT shares were under pressure on Monday after IT major Accenture delivered mixed results for the first quarter of FY23, coupled with cautious commentary on client spending. Infosys and TCS shed 1% each in Monday's firm trade, while Wipro was down 0.2%. CoForge and Persistent Systems were the top drags within mid-caps, and the Nifty IT index was the sole sectoral loser. Accenture delivered 15% YOY revenue growth in constant currency terms, exceeding expectations. However, it pegged the next quarter's revenue below analyst estimates, leaving the full year revenue growth guidance untouched at 8 to 11 percent. This is reportedly the first time since FY17 that Accenture has not upgraded its full year guidance after the first quarter. Analysts believe that the unchanged guidance compared to a 26 percent growth in FY22 is indicative of softening of demand for IT services and growth moderation for companies. We maintain our cautious stance on the demand outlook for the IT sector and think consensus revenue growth estimates for FY24 may see downward revisions. Aniket Pandey of ICICI Securities adds that the industry's lower employee addition further reflects the slowdown in revenue. So Accenture, in spite of, uh, in spite of delivering growth on its higher end of estimates, they have still maintained their FY23 YOYCC guidance, right? Uh, and this is in spite of strong growth coming into last quarter also, okay? But if you look at closely at this number, right? I mean, uh, uh, this is basically in second half FI23, the revenue growth guidance just implies a growth of about 5.6 to 9.6% YOYCC, okay? Uh, which was almost around 25% YOYCC in second half of FI22, right? So growth is normalizing very aggressively from 25% YOYCC, it is coming down to 5.6% to 9.6% CC. So I believe from here on there would be a revenue moderation coming in entire IT ecosystem. Okay, And Indian IT stocks are more sensitive to revenue growth as compared to EPS growth. So we believe that the sector is still trading at around 22.5 times, okay, which is almost about 30 to 35% premium to its pre-COVID multiples. Okay. So, yeah, there are more uh, uh, headwinds or risk to the revenue estimates on the downside than to the upside at this present scenario. Accenture has also signaled rising caution among clients, which are now shifting to large cost transformation deals over smaller projects. This positions larger IT firms more favorably than mid, small-sized firms, according to Jefferies, which remains selective in the sector. On the other hand, Accenture posted a sharp decline in attrition to 13% vis-a-vis 20% in the preceding quarter, boosting the margin outlook for domestic IT players. One needs to understand, right, we are entering into a planned recession environment, okay? So this is not as what we can compare with 2008, 11, and even between, even what happened in COVID, okay? There are no big uncertain risks on table, actually, right? Those events were completely uncertain in nature. This is a planned recession, right? So clients or vendors are also planning according to it, actually, okay? So my sense is that, I mean, the impact on revenue growth would be visible in Q1 and Q2 of FI24 actually, okay? Margins will bottom out from here on, but don't expect any massive tailwinds on margins actually. Pandey suggests investors take a staggered approach to taking positions in the sector. Over the next six months, a 3 to 6 percent EPS cut, nearly equivalent of a 7 to 10 percent fall in the IT index, could provide investors with good buying opportunities at better prices, he says. That said, markets will seek direction from their global counterparts today. Besides, the Bank of Japan's rate hike decision will also be on the radar. The government recently cleared the environmental release of a genetically modified variety of mustard. The move has triggered a debate around it. It has been challenged in the Supreme Court too. Environmental activists and several groups representing farmers are bent against GM crops. But what exactly are they and why is so much debate going on around them? The 
the natural process of reproduction passes down the genetic materials from one generation to another. The genetic materials called genes of each organism have its characteristics embedded in them. One of the aspects of genes is their ability to evolve and adapt to its environment. This is called mutation, but it takes generations to successfully mutate and adapt. But by genetically modifying a plant, we take the charge of natural evolution to produce desired results. For instance, by genetically modifying a rice plant to resist pests, humans can save on pesticides, but the natural process of evolution and reproduction are compromised, and these interventions have certain limitations and potential dangers. Even though genetically modified plants achieve resistance to the potential dangers like pests and weeds in the short run, in the longer run the pests weeds might achieve dominance over the modified plants through mutation. This may put the agriculture production in danger. Also, the genetically modified plants will contain proteins and other biochemicals that are not familiar to human metabolism. They can create allergic reactions in humans. One of the other aspects of potential dangers of genetically modified plants is that its effects on pollinators like honeybees. India had introduced a genetically modified version of the cotton plant called Bt cotton in 2002. Now, we are the second largest producer of cotton in the world and 90% of the cotton that is produced in India is Bt cotton. India's edible oil import bill jumped 34.18% to Rs 1.57 trillion in the year ending October 2022. The government now wants to cut down on the import bill. And by introducing GM mustard seeds in India, it expects to achieve self-sufficiency in edible oil production. Around 20 other GM species are awaiting its permission to be cultivated in India. In 2010, India blocked it the release of genetically modified Bt brinjal. Trusted Bank, SBI, the banker to every Indian. For more news and analysis, log on to business-standard.com. We'll be back tomorrow with our next episode. Thank you for watching. If you like this video, share it and subscribe to Business Standard. For more news, views and insights, log on to www.business-standard.com. Do also follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, Telegram and LinkedIn.